Welcome to A Night for Truth. I'm Tom Howard, and I have with me here today Dr. Alice von Hildebrand, who is the wife of the great philosopher and theologian Dietrich von Hildebrand, of whom Cardinal Ratzinger has said in his introduction to a forthcoming biography of Dietrich von Hildebrand that when the history of the 20th century church is written, the name of Dietrich von Hildebrand will be in the very forefront of significant figures in the church during this century. Well, Lily, where shall we start about your husband? Well, I would like to start with a word of gratitude. Uh, gratitude played a tremendous role in my husband's life, and I feel extremely indebted to Mother Angelica, to Doc Keck, to my producer, Steve Bomo, and to you, on my host, and being to guide this program, for allowing me to communicate, to share with the world, many, many, many people, all the tremendous riches that I have received from my husband. I'm not a convert. I'm a cradle Catholic. And yet, when I met him, I was converted. There was a totally new dimension of Roman Catholicism that opened up to me, and for which I'm so immensely grateful. And if I've ever had modest achievements in my life, they're all to be traced back to what he's given me. And the purpose of these programs is to share with you, and possibly with very many other people, what he has given me. Billy, can you tell us how you first met him? I know that's not the beginning of his life, but how did you first well, come you know, across? Well, you know, don't get me on a soundtrack, because if I start talking about this, it's going to take me a half hour. I was a student at Manhattanville College in New York. I was living with an uncle and aunt at the Waldorf Astoria, and uh, they finally had allowed me to go to an American college, even though she was very much afraid that I was going to lose my faith and my moral if I mingled in this strange country that was the United States. And my professor of philosophy was a German refugee of the name of Baldwin Schwartz. His English was very bad, but he, he spoke French a lot better than English, and he started speaking in French, and he discovered that I had a real interest in philosophical questions. And one day he said to me, you know my closest friend, who used to be my teacher, gives liturgical evenings in his apartment on 40, 448 Central Park West, uh, very close to Harlem. It was not particularly elegant. And so I went there, and he was giving a talk about transformation in Christ. And he did it in such an amazing way that I recall having tears in my eyes and saying to myself, I, a cradle Catholic, have never, never heard a priest or a nun talking about the necessity to be reborn, to be changed, to be chiseled by Christ in such a fashion. And I went back home inebriated. It was only an overwhelming experience. And I'm interested, you know, it's interesting to say that many of his students, for example, a young Jew who took his courses, then converted and founded the first Carthusian monastery in Vermont, had exactly the same response. Once he heard my husband talk, he grew wings and he discovered the beauty of Roman Catholicism, totally new dimension. Well, let me first tell you about his background. He was blessed. And even though when I met him, he was a refugee, living in extreme poverty, in a slummy apartment, as he close to Harlem, he had horsey shoes that touched me particularly for some reason because the contrast between his message and his poverty was something that touched a young and idealistic girl very, very deeply. And one of the first things that he told me, living in poverty, having abandoned and lost absolutely everything, was, you know, I had a marvelous youth. Gratitude. And he started to tell me about his youth. He was born and raised in Florence. Now, to me, Florence is the most beautiful city. There are lots of beautiful cities, but I mean, my heart goes to Florence. And he was born in an old 16th century convent that was owned by St. Francesco di Paola in the 16th century. And then he was secularized by Napoleon 
in the 19th century and then was dilapidated and so on. And his father, who was a young, extremely talented artist, being wise, moved to Italy. You know, if you love beauty and if you love art, where do you have to live? In Italy. And I might just uh, in, uh, interpose a very small comment here, really, on the very point you're making, but as a, as a reader who never met Dietrich von Hildebrand, uh, I kept thinking of uh, St. Augustine in certain ways uh, and various other figures down through the church when I, uh, the more I learned about Dietrich von Hildebrand's life, because uh, as I think you will see as we talk about his work, there's a seamlessness between his life, the texture of his life, uh, this life in Florence, and his, his titanic vision of what the Catholic faith is. He, he was a profoundly civilized man. I, every line that he writes, I have this feeling, you know, this is issuing from someone who knows what it is to be human. And uh, I'm always impressed with that. But I'm just saying that by way of underlining the, the importance of what Dr. von Hildebrand is saying at this point, uh, because his background is not just merely uh, incidental to his work. It seems to me it, it, it forms the matrix from which this, this luminous and civilized mind speaks. Well, you formulated it so well that you put me to shame. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say uh, what is human, let me say that his very particular mission is going to be show what humanity, this human characteristic, can become when transformed by Christ. But I mean, this is anticipating my topic. Well, just imagine he was born in this magnificent old convent with a magnificent garden, a hill commanding the most superb view of Florence framed by tree. That was the world in which he was lived. He was born. He was preceded by five sisters five sisters. Father and mother had sort of given up the idea of every having a son because every single time there was another girl and lovely girls. All of them were great loves of my husband, played a tremendous role in his life and they remained very, very close their whole lives on. And then the little boy was born that was on the 12th of October 1889. The same day, same year, as Christopher Dawson and Eric Privara, and the same day as Eric Stein. But she was born two years later. An auspicious day. You know, very strange that it should be on Columbus Day for someone who was going to spend so many years in the United States. The last thing that he anticipated. And of course, there was a sort of exaltation in San Francisco that was the name of the house. A little boy, finally a little boy. And the child was brought to the living room where the five sisters were awaiting this great event with fantastic expectation and the nurse carried the baby. And his younger sister, that is to say the youngest of the five girls called Bertola, who was very naive and very direct, looked at the baby and said, in Italian of course, but this is not at all a little brother, that's a monkey. <laughs> Little did she know what he would end up doing. When maybe he looked a little bit like a monkey, you know, new well, most newborn, babies do. Newborn babies are not beauties, but nevertheless, they're so cute, they just bring you heart. Well, at any rate, he had a marvelous youth. He was, of course, his mother's pet child. I mean, a boy, and on top of it, there was a tremendous affinity between them. Uh, his love, five sisters just adored their little brother. Each one of them was so talented. But when I once I was telling someone about it, he says, oh no, nobody's going to buy that. That sounds too beautiful to be true. But it was so. You know, the oldest one, Nini, was 13 years older, almost 14, was an accomplished pianist. The second one turned out to be a remarkable painter. I have some of her paintings, and I believe that one day she will be discovered truly as, uh, as a genius. The third one was a sculptor. The fourth one was writing little stories and poetry. And the fifth one was a musician, and so talented, she was engaged to Fort, uh, Wilhelm Furtwängler for a while, and he said to, to her one day, you know, Bertler, you're the most musical person I met in my life. This is Furtwängler, so who's yes. the great German... And then doctor. comes a little boy, and each, each particular sister 
spend time to him and try to show him, for example, paintings or introduce him to the music of Beethoven or Mozart. Of course, there were quartets and quintets and octets played in the house and so on. I mean, just imagine an ideal background. Yes, I should uh, weasel in here at this point. This was an authentically Renaissance household. Absolutely. Uh, in, in the Renaissance, and particularly the Italian Renaissance, and particularly the northern Italian cities, uh, you had this, this sense that you know, family life was well, uh, an important, more than an important ingredient, I mean, of the very essence, was you know, this, this, this urbanity, this familiarity, not only familiarity with, for example, music, but the ability to... to um, to perform and to, it was to be, you knew, they, they, call, they called it sprezzatura, you know, <laughs> the, you, you, you were good at these things. And this is an excessively rare household in the 20th century. I mean, you know, right there we have a major the problem because some people don't believe that something like that truly exists. I mean, imagine a little well, child of three up. and four, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and his sister playing the so, uh, sonatas of Beethoven and, and Mozart and Schubert on the piano. So by the time he was seven or eight or ten, he knew them by heart, so to speak, and then would say to his sister, play that particular movement, that is the one that I love best, and of course he performed for his sake. He never heard of MTV. You probably have never heard of it. No, but, no. But I'm a bit old-fashioned, I feel. Well, it's, a, it's a very popular sort of television, that, but they don't play Beethoven and Schubert. Well, I mean, at any rate, he always had private tutors. He never went to school, and this is a blessing, because just imagine going to sweaty German schools, where the students are often smelly very strongly, and I must tell you about that place, it is very funny, and uh, at any rate, you know, use coarse words, and vulgar manners and that sort of thing. He had private tutors and they came to Florence and were tutoring him. First he had, he was born and raised in Italy, so his first language was Italian. And not surprisingly enough, when he was a dying man, the last days of his life, he was speaking Italian to me. That was his first language. And then of course German, because his parents spoke German. And then when he was six, until he was nine, he had a private French governess and he studied everything in French. And he fell in love with France, you know, the songs of France and the tradition of France and the stories and so on and so on. And he became absolutely fluent in French. But the first book that he read was a biblical story, written by a German priest who happened to be Catholic, and, uh, you know, because the children could color the pictures of Abraham or Isaac. And he read it three times from beginning to end. And he said to me, the amazing thing is that I felt this was a different world. He could not quite pinpoint what it was, but he was fascinated by it. How old was he? He, was, he was five. five. And there comes another thing which I would like to emphasize because I think it's a key. My husband received graces long before he knew that the word grace exists. Will you tell that little incident? And I'm going to tell you several incidents that simply illumine the fact that God does give His grace to whom He pleases. His father and mother were Protestant, but liberal Protestant who never went to church. He never saw them pray. Did not exist. You know, they were good people, I mean, particularly, you know, warm hearted, generous, kind, friendly, willing to help others, and that sort of thing. But religion that was passe. You know, their God was beauty. And one of his sisters, who said to him, you know, uh, Christ is uh, a good man, but of course, who would be crazy enough to compare him to Beethoven or Shakespeare? You know, that would be sheer madness, you know, just to show you. And one day, he was sleeping with his older sister, Bessela. He was five and she was eight, and she told me, because he had forgotten the story, and she said to him, you know, Mommy said at table to know that Christ is a child of God, as everybody is a child of God, there was nothing special about it. And she told me this little boy jumped up in his pyjama and stretched his hand and said to a bachelor, I tell you Christ is God. Five years old. And he forgot it. And she was the one who was so impressed, where in the world did he get that from? 
You know, in other words, from the very beginning, even though neither his father nor his mother nor his five sisters had the slightest interest in religion, you know, they went to a Catholic church because there was a beautiful painting or beautiful sculptor or something of the sort, but I mean, the idea of praying. When he was 14, he heard the Passion according to St. Matthew of Bach. And that was for him overwhelming. Once again, this other world, you know, mm -hmm. was moving and touching him very, very deeply. At this time, the Hildebrands were living six months in Florence and six months in, in Munich because his father had become so famous that he was knighted by the king of Bavaria and this is why he has the title von Hildebrand which in German indicates aristocracy and so they lived six months in Florence and six months in Munich you must tell us a bit about his father uh, well, at some point that's awfully here. tempting that's all because he was a great personality I mean a great great artist and the amazing thing about him is that even though he was so great and received one honor after another, you know, it was von Hildebrand and then it was Excellence and then it went further and further and further and he was just a famous man, he had no vanity and he had no difficulty whatever to praise the work of another artist, which is very, very rare. They're going to find it difficult for a philosopher to praise another philosopher, for a theologian to praise another theologian, for a musician to praise another musician. For him it was, you know, he was so objective. If it is true, if someone does it better than I, why not recognize it? Well, I mean, at any rate, at the age, you know, I have to go fast, and I tell you why. There's so much to be said, and as this biography is going to be published by Father Fesso, Ignatius Press, uh, in, in the year 2000, for which I thank Father Fesso from the bottom of my heart, and the title of the book is going to be The Soul of a Lion, and I think this applies beautifully to someone who was a lion, as we shall see. Well, I must confess, uh, the very first picture I saw of your husband, the he didn't look like a lion, but the the gravity and the grandeur and I would almost say the majesty uh, in his face there is something leonine about that you know and so I'm very happy very with that. Was this, well it wasn't discovered by me it was discovered by friends of mine when I was talking about my husband's death well I'll get to that later on I mean, at any rate at 17 he entered the university which is awfully young that he already had completed studies in Latin and in Greek and in Greek and whatever it was and his beloved mother at the age of 50 started to study Latin and Greek so that she could accompany her son through his studies in his I mean just an amazing woman at the age of 50 she was 50 she was 50 or 52 when nice she started age to yes. start Greek and Latin Greek and Latin yes but I mean she was an amazing woman and she was very fluent in four languages like all the Hildebrands by the way he went to the university, and at first he was taking the course of a very good man, but I mean, nevertheless, he was not enthused. And then, quite accidentally, at a party or a conference, he made the acquaintance of a man called Max Scheler. Now, Max Scheler today is a big, big name in philosophy, because there's absolutely no doubt about the fact that he was a philosophical genius. And I have compared what Edith Stein who had exactly the same training as my husband, and my husband say about Scheler, it's a perfect duplicate. Both had a feeling from the first day, there is a genius. He was a man who could talk about anything and change it into gold. He had a sort of, uh, you know, talent that was so overwhelming that everything he said was interesting. And this is a name that a lot of us lay people nowadays probably might not know, Max Scheler. But uh, I think the audience needs to. You know, get nevertheless, that in their several, and this is Edith Stein, who. Uh, several of we his works have not been translated. I mean, at least the intellectuals, or the so called intellectuals, know his name. Mm. And he deserves it because he was a very great man. And they developed quite a friendship. My husband had never met someone as brilliant as he was intellectually speaking. And they would spend hours and hours in coffee shops in Munich as one did at two and three in the morning discussing philosophy and exchange and so on and so on. Scheler was a fallen away Catholic. He had been baptized, but unfortunately, unfortunately, he was the prisoner of lust and was leading a very, very bad life and was quite conscious of the fact 
I'm a sinner, but cannot be helped. He had a catastrophic marriage, and this time he was separated from his wife, and at any rate it was a divorcee, and so on, so marriage wasn't valid. And they talked and talked and talked, one very fine day out of a blue sky, and this is crucial in my husband's life, so I'm going to dramatize it. Sheila said to my husband, you know the Catholic Church has a truth. My husband was stunned. The Catholic Church has a truth. He always was a passionate love of truth. Already at the age of 13, he had a fight with his older sister, who was defending relativism and saying everything is relative. And he said, you're mistaken, and he refuted her. They went back to San Francisco, and she said to their father, you know, he doesn't want to understand that values are relative. And the father said, now look, Bert, he's only 13. And the young boy peaked, said, Dad, if you have no better arguments against my position than that, your position must be very weak indeed. He was absolutely convinced of the objectivity of truth and the objectivity of moral values. And I think uh, this is worth also hoisting a little red flag or something, because all of his work is absolutely predicated on this fundamental notion of the, the absolute objectivity and fixed nature of truth. Not for truth, truth addresses us. Absolutely. We do not judge it. It judges absolutely. us. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that, again, virtually everything he ever said on, on any topic, theology, psychology, if you will. Aesthetics, uh, the, ethics, aesthetics, whatever ethics. he wrote. You know, uh, the imprint it, is, is truth. It's and truth. in a sense, that, that is a, uh, an, a point of view which is virtually uh, alien to our own late 20th century You see, let ethos. me repeat, he was living in a liberal world. Yes. Well, that is, relativism was a matter of course. Yes. And he stood it, and he knew his father, his mother, his five sisters had different views. And he always said to me, it made no impression, I loved them so profoundly, that I knew they were wrong. So why should I follow them? So Shaver suddenly says, the Catholic Church has truth. And he was so stunned, he said, what do you mean? He had lived in Italy so many years. He knew, he never had met a, Roman, a practicing Roman Catholic. They were the servants, but they were so ignorant, and many of them were not practicing. Catholic Church. He says, what do you mean? Now, this is going probably to be the next program, the next segment that we're going to make. He said, the Catholic Church produces saints. A saint? That was not in my husband's vocabulary. What can possibly a saint be? Once again, he was amazed. What's a saint? And Shayla, animated by God's grace, used his genius to etch the essence of holiness. And in order to exemplify his views, he referred to St. Francis of Assisi. And that was for my husband the decisive moment in his life. From this moment on, he realized there is another world, infinitely superior, no. infinitely more beautiful. All right. How shall we bring this to a point? This That's is the, your job. This is the end of this episode. But I think several big things have come out. The absolute nature of truth, the, uh, the, the category holiness uh, is, again, virtually unknown to mere culture, to mere art. You know, all of that splendor which is uh, Italy and so on. So I think as we get into the work of your husband and the rest of his biography, we, we will see the tremendous illuminating influence which absolutism and holiness had on his work. Thank you very much, Lily.